Your Royal Highnesses, distinguished and honored guests, it gives me great pleasure here today to talk to you about the future, your future. Now, after such a great introduction, I can't wait to hear the speaker myself. Let me say that I'm a physicist, and I've had the privilege of interviewing over 300 of the world's top scientists for this book. So let me quote from that great physicist, Niels Bohr. Niels Bohr once said, quote, prediction is awfully hard to do, especially if it's about the future. Let me also quote from that other great scientist, Woody Allen. Woody Allen once said, quote, eternity is an awful long time, especially toward the end. Now, I'm a physicist. What do we do? We invent things. We invented the laser. We invented the transistor. We helped to assemble the first computer. We constructed the internet. We also wrote the World Wide Web. And along the way, we also invented television. We invented radio, x-ray machines, we invented most of what you see in a hospital. Also, we helped to create the space program. We created the GPS satellites. We created weather satellites. And now we are inventing the future. So in my last book, Physics of the Impossible, I even go farther into the future, not 5, 10, 20 years, but 1,000 years into the future when we might even have time travel, perhaps starships, perhaps even teleportation. But today, I want to talk about your life. What will your life look like in five, ten years? And then Ray Kurzweil will talk about even the bigger picture. So some people say, ha, huh, you cannot predict the future. You can't even predict the past. Nobody predicted the crash of 2008. Well, that's not quite true. You see, what is the origin of wealth? Where does prosperity and wealth come from? Ultimately, it comes from science. But science comes in waves. One invention, the steam invention, creates a cascade of secondary invention which creates wealth, fantastic wealth. And wealth often creates a bubble, a huge bubble. And when it pops, you get a depression. So before talking about the future, let's talk about the past. Around 1800, we physicists worked out the thermodynamics of steam engines. From that, we could compute how much energy it would take to create a locomotive. That created textile mills. That created factories, railroads, tremendous wealth that we had never seen before. For the first time in history, there was a bubble, a huge bubble that formed on the London Stock Exchange, and the bubble was unsustainable, and it popped in 1850. In fact, the crisis of 1850 was so great that it even gave birth to a philosophy called Marxism. We physicists are restless too. Eighty years later, we pioneered the next great invention, electricity, magnetism, the internal combustion engine. And that created a second bubble, a tremendous bubble on the American Stock Exchange in utility stocks, and automobile stocks. The bumble was unsustainable, and it popped in 1929, 80 years. 80 years later, we physicists created the next set of wealth, lasers, computers, transistors, the internet, and it created a bubble, a huge bubble. And the bubble in the United States was in real estate, and it popped in 2008. And even as we speak in this room, this month, there's a bubble in Europe that probably will also pop. And that bubble 
was created to maintain the Mediterranean lifestyle. Well, that is also unsustainable, and it will pop sometime this year. So the question that we physicists are asking, and this is the question, what is the fourth wave? The first wave was steam power. The second wave was electricity. The third wave was high tech. The fourth wave, we're not sure, but we think it's going to be a combination. Hold on a second. We think it's going to be a combination of biotechnology, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology. So let's say a few things about information, and Ray Kurzweil will amplify this in his lecture. This is Moore's law, which says that computer power doubles roughly every 18 months. What does this curve mean? Today, if you get a birthday card in the mail, you open it up, and it sings "Happy Birthday to You." There's a chip in that birthday card. That chip has more computer power than all the Allied forces of 1945. Stalin, Hitler, Churchill would have killed to get that chip. And what do you do with it? You throw it away in the garbage. Look at this curve. Look at 1969. We put two men on the moon. Ever see these old videotapes of the man in the moon shot? Look at those old computers. Oh my God! You're not going to send me in outer space, backed up by those computers. How much computer power did they have in 1969? Less than your cell phone. We sent people into outer space. Backed up by the power of today's cell phone, and now take a look at 2020. When you start to look into the future, you now know that this curve predicts that chips will cost roughly a penny in 2020. That means you now know the future of the computer. The future of the computer is to disappear, to be everywhere. And nowhere. Where is running water today? Running water is under your feet. It's in the walls, in the ceiling. Where is electricity today? Electricity is under the floor, in the walls, in the ceiling. When you walk into a room, what is the first thing you do? You look for the light switch. In the future, when you walk into this room, the first thing you will do is look for the internet portal. You will assume that the floor, the ceiling, and the walls are intelligent, and the word "computer" will disappear from the English language, just like electricity. No one says that anymore. No one says electricity. And where does electricity come from? You know, the clouds someplace. Who knows where electricity comes from? So in the future. Where will computer power come from? It'll come from the cloud, and where is it? It is everywhere and nowhere, including your glasses. Google recently came out with internet glasses. Other internet glasses can recognize people's faces. How many times have you been at a conference like this, and you bump into somebody, and you say? I know this person. It's Jim, John, Jake. I know this person. In the future, your glasses will say, "It's Jim, stupid." Remember, you meet him every year at this conference. And let's say you're looking for a job, and you're at a cocktail party, and you don't know who the important people are. In the future, you will know exactly who to suck up to at any cocktail party. Right next to their name is their biography, and if they speak Chinese to you, compliments of Google, it'll be translated into your language as subtitles beneath that person's image. Now, maybe you don't want to look like a refugee from Star Trek. In the future, it will be fashionable. Children are the driving force behind this technology. In fact, video games is a bigger industry than all of Hollywood movies. That's how big this industry is, generated by children. Now, there's several ways you can do this. 
you can shoot the image directly to the retina of your eye or the lens of your glasses can be used as a screen or the military uses an eyepiece. They flick down an eyepiece. And eventually fashion models will wear these things. Eventually at fancy parties, people will be able to download movies, download documents, teleconference, right there in your glasses. But there's a problem. Let's say you don't wear glasses. Let's say you don't like glasses. Then what are you going to do? You will blink and you will go online. These internet contact lenses, who will be the first people to buy internet contact lenses? College students studying for final examinations. <laughs> they will blink and instantly they'll see all the exam questions right there in their eyepiece. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Actors, actresses, politicians. Politicians will never say anything stupid again because their script is right there in front of them. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Artists, architects, they'll wave their hands and 3D printers will print out beautiful buildings, homes, works of art, simply by waving your hands in, in, the, in the air. Who else will buy these internet contact lenses? Tourists. If you're in a foreign country and you don't speak the language, that's a problem. How can you buy anything unless you speak the language? In the future, we'll have universal translators giving you subtitles as people speak to you. And if you're in Rome, you will see the Roman Empire resurrected from the ruins of the Roman Empire. In China, in the Summer Palace outside Beijing, that Summer Palace has been resurrected in the same way. Artists have illustrated the Summer Palace of 1860 before it was burned down by the British and the French. So who will want these internet contact lenses? Everybody. Now what is this called? This is called augmented reality. Virtual reality is for children. Virtual reality is when you put on glasses and there's a cartoon. There's a cartoon inside your glasses. That's virtual reality. This is for adults. This is called augmented reality. And it's not a new idea. In fact, there's a Hollywood movie a Hollywood movie which introduced people to augmented reality. What was that Hollywood movie? Well, here is the former governor of California in a very bad mood. It's the Terminator robot. And when the Terminator robot sees John Connor, there's a biography, a biography next to his name. So in the future, you will always know who you are talking to. You will always know what they are saying. And this applies to all aspects of industry, commerce. Let's say that your husband sometimes does the shopping, but your husband always buys the wrong thing. In the future, when you send out your husband, the image in his contact lens will be sent to you at home you will see what he is seeing and he will always buy the right thing. If you're a boss, you will see what your staff is seeing when they make an inspection overseas because what they see in their contact lens can be broadcast immediately to the boss. This is going to change the way in which we do everything. If you're an astronaut, in outer space and you're making repairs you don't have time to look at the blueprint boom you see the blueprint right inside your contact lens and the military has its own version I flew down to Fort Benning Georgia with the science channel and we filmed this it already exists this is not science fiction the military version is this big it is half an inch long it fits on your helmet or your sunglasses you flick it down and immediately you're online. 
the internet of the battlefield. This is already operational. You see enemy forces, friendly forces, artillery, armor, all of that right in your contact lens. And how will you pay for all of this? In the future, money will be digitalized. For example, music is already digitalized. And there's a warning here. The music industry was told that one day music will be digitalized. And the music industry said, ha, people will always buy music the old-fashioned way. They will always go to the store and buy a disc. They will always buy a stereo of some sort. Wrong. You know who controls the music industry today? It's amazing. The company which controls the music industry today is Apple Computer. Apple Computer controls the music industry. That's what happens if you ignore technology. So in the future, when you want to buy something, you simply point and click. Point and click. In Japan, you can already do this. You can go to department stores in Japan, point and click, and it could be your wristwatch. It could be your jewelry, whatever. You point and click. Money becomes digitalized in the future. And this is what your cell phone looks like in the future. Today, if you try to type a message on your cell phone and you have fat fingers, sorry about that. You can't type on a cell phone. In the future, you'll scroll out intelligent paper. This is e-paper. Every dot in e-paper is a transistor. You can scroll out as much paper as you want from your cell phone to create a screen, a keyboard, or anything you want. And this is the future of your living room. We can create yards, yards of intelligent paper. And this is the future of wallpaper. Because remember, chips cost a penny in about 10 years' time. Now today, if your wallpaper is old, discolored, ugly, what do you do? You suffer. What can you do? Your wallpaper. In the future, you talk to your wallpaper and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Please change color right now. Here's your wallet of the future. Screens are flexible and they move. They move. Here it was what newspapers might be like in the future. And this is your living room. This is your living room of the future, surrounded 360 degrees. And this is called the cave. The cave is when you have four walls surrounding you. And I took a film crew from the Science Channel. We flew to the University of Maryland. They actually have a cave. Four screens show images of dinosaurs. They put me in the middle, and I was in the middle of a dinosaur fight with dinosaurs coming at me in all directions. In the future, at a football game, you will see yourself right in the middle, right in the middle of a football game, because you'll be surrounded by this technology. This dog over here, by the way, is a virtual dog. It plays with your children runs, barks, plays with your children. However, it doesn't exist. It is a virtual dog. In fact, this is creating a problem for the English language. We have a contradiction in terms as chips go into toys, as toys become more intelligent. That contradiction in terms is smart Barbie dolls. That's a contradiction in terms. Another contradiction in terms is Microsoft works. <laughs> that is also a contradiction in terms. And in the future, if you are a college student on Friday night and you have no date, you're lonely, it's Friday night, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the wall screen and say, mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's available tonight? Boom! Your wall screen sets you up because it knows the kind of person you like. And then you see a movie like Casablanca with Humphrey Bogart. But then you say to the mirror, 
mirror, mirror on the wall, please remove Humphrey Bogart's face and put my face instead. You will be the hero of every single action movie. And even farther in the future, let's say you're a stamp collector. Let's say you're a coin collector. And you want to meet other coin collectors outside. What do you do? You sign up for a service, a dating service, a stamp collector service, whatever. And as people walk by you, their faces light up. Their faces light up in your contact lens because they too are coin collectors. They too are stamp collectors, or they too want to meet a date for Friday night. So in the future, when you want to meet somebody for Friday night, what do you do? You go outside. This is the future of television. People have always wanted 3D TV, but it never happened. Why? You have to have those glasses, those awful glasses to have 3D. Well, we physicists said, now wait a minute. We can use optics to create 3D without glasses. It's called lenticular technology. This screen is no ordinary screen. This screen consists of thousands of vertical lines, thousands of vertical lines. Each vertical line is a prism. It cuts the image in half. One half goes to the left eye, one half goes to the right eye, and boom, 3D without glasses. This is going to be in your living room in the coming years. Already, if you play video games, you know that the first video games hit the market this year with lenticular technology. And this is also the future of glass. This is your window of the future. Your window of the future is intelligent because chips only cost a penny. You simply talk to the window and the window changes. If you want to see the Eiffel Tower, you want to see the Taj Mahal, boom, you just talk to it. So this is how 3D TV works. If you look down on the TV, these are vertical lines. This cuts the image in half. One half goes to the left eye, one half goes to the right eye, and that's how you have 3D television without glasses. The key is the screen. This is your office of the future. As we said before, chips cost a penny. Why should your office be based around a PC? The only place that we will find a PC in the future is in a museum. These are disposable computers. You simply scribble on them and then throw them away. They only cost a penny. But the scribble follows you in the cloud. As you go from room to room, room to house, house to home, home to car, car to office, the files follow you in the cloud. So think of water. Where does water come from? Well, a lake, a reservoir someplace. But how do you access water? With a faucet. That's all you need is a faucet. The water comes from a, ra a reservoir or a lake. The same thing with computer power. In the future, your appliances will be faucets. Faucets that access a lake called the cloud. And this is your cubicle of the future. It'll be beautiful, gorgeous, three-dimensional. It'll be so beautiful you will never get any work done in the future. And this is how you will drive in the future. This is a car of the future that drives itself. Today, we know that people get tired. They fall asleep. They get drunk. In the United States alone, 40,000 Americans die every year needlessly on the highway. What we need are cars that use GPS that drive themselves. I had a chance to drive this car. BBC Television flew me down to North Carolina, and they put me in this car. There I was driving the car, having a wonderful time with the sports car. Then the cameraman said, let go of the steering wheel. And I said, what? Are you crazy? I'm not going to let go of the steering wheel. And the cameraman said, trust me, let go of the steering wheel. So I closed my eyes and I went like this and the car drove itself. 
Now, after today's talk, let's do a science experiment. Get in your car and go like this, and see how far you get driving your car. But that is how you will drive your car in the future. GPS is good for about six inches, roughly six inches. That's the air. There are radar, radar in the fenders, and these cars have been tested. In fact, the Pentagon even had a contest with these cars. These cars are safer than human cars because humans get distracted, humans fall asleep. These cars do not. And as I mentioned, forty thousand people die needlessly. So in the future, the words "traffic accident," "traffic jam" will disappear from the language. Computers. No one will say the word "computer" anymore. No one will say the words "traffic accident" anymore. Then, how will you buy things in the future? Today, if you go to a dress store and you see the perfect dress, right color, right shape, right design, everything's perfect, but wrong size. What happens today? No sale. In the future, you whip out your credit card. Your credit card has your precise three-dimensional measurements. You send it to the factory. The factory punches it out, and boom! The next day, you get it in the mail. Everything will fit in the future. This is called mass customization, not mass production. In fact, Henry Ford of Ford Motors was the one who popularized mass production. Henry Ford was famous for saying, "Quote: The American people can have any color car they want, as long as it's black." In the future, you'll have anything you want in any color, any shape, any size, because of mass customization. And this is how you will pay for things. When you go to a store today, you don't really know how much things cost. Supply and demand, yeah, that's nice. It's a theory. The theory says that when supply equals demand, that's the cost. That's what things cost. But even Adam Smith said this is imperfect. People don't really know what something really costs. And in the future, we will have something called perfect capitalism, not imperfect capitalism. When you walk into a store of the future. Your contact lens will scan all chips, scan the chips in all the goods that you see, and tell you immediately who has the cheapest product, who has the best product. How much does it really cost to make something? So the advantage shifts to the consumer. The consumer knows everything about anything simply by looking at their contact lens, scanning all the chips. Because chips cost less than the barcode, and finding out what things really cost. So, if you're the manufacturer, how will you fight back? You will fight back because of data mining, targeted marketing, positioning, and branding. So, if you're a company owner, knowing that the consumer knows everything, no, the consumer knows that your product is not the best product. Your product is not the cheapest. How will you fight back? Advertising, branding, positioning, data mining, targeted marketing. That's how the producer will fight back in the future. And of course, service, courtesy. That one-to-one -one human interaction could seal the deal. That's also going to be even more important in the high-tech age. So remember, in high-tech age, you have to have high touch. As well as high tech, so now let's talk about an even bigger revolution, bigger than anything we've talked about. We talked about music. Music is digitalized. Money is being digitalized now. The next industry to be digitalized is medicine. This is going to change everything. And as David Baltimore once said, Nobel laureate, all medicine, he said. Will be reduced to computer science. So let's talk about medicine. How small can you make a chip? We can make a chip so small you could put it inside an aspirin pill with a TV camera and a magnet. You swallow it, and it goes down, taking motion pictures of your insides. 
because we all know what middle-aged men fear the most. Middle-aged men fear the C word, colonoscopy. And this gives new meaning for the expression intel inside. In the future, intel will always be inside. And let's talk about cancer. Believe it or not, we can now attack cancer cell by cell. This is undergoing human trials right now, not monkey trials, not mouse trials, human trials right now, as we take molecules, arm them with poisons, and they seek out individual cancer cells and kill them. One way, for example, is the following. A cancer cell has holes on its walls. The holes are large and irregular. A normal cell has small round holes. Cancer cells have large raggedy holes. We can make a molecule halfway between the two, too big to fit in the small hole of a healthy cell, but small enough to fit right into a cancer cell and kill it. That's one of several mechanisms we have of killing cancer cells one by one. And in the next slide, you will see the miracle weapon that will reduce the word tumor and kick it out of the English language. The next device will conquer cancer because of prevention. Watch. It is your toilet. In the future, your toilet will tell you that you eat too much, too much sugar, too much salt in your diet. Isn't the future wonderful? Even your toilet will tell you that you eat too much. But in this toilet, there's a chip. This chip has all the power of Silicon Valley. These chips are so tiny, they capture DNA. That's how small they are. They can capture DNA fragments from cancer cells, identify cancer, and tell you that you will have cancer in 10 years' time. Steve Jobs, the founder of Apple Computer, died of pancreatic cancer. All the doctors say it's aggressive, incurable, unstoppable, kills you in three to four years. But the genes for pancreatic cancer were sequenced just a few months ago. We found out that that is actually wrong. The cancer which killed the founder of Apple Computer is a slow-growing cancer. 20 years for it to form a tumor which kills you. But only in the last three years do you feel it. You don't feel anything for 17 years, but it's growing inside your body. So in some sense, Steve Jobs died too early because with these DNA chips, we can detect cancer years before it forms. So in the future, your toilet will say, you have cancer. Do something. You have 20 years. And in the future, by the way, we can also make mirrors in your bathroom. Bathroom mirrors with DNA chips. This already exists. You blow in it. <sighs> and when you blow on it, it detects the moisture and calculates if you have a mutated P53 gene implicated in 50% of all common cancers. Your bathroom mirror will tell you if you have lung cancer. The word tumor could disappear from the English language. And MRI scans are like the tricorder of Star Trek. But MRI scans are huge. Whoops. MRI scans are huge, gigantic. Why? Why do MRI scans have to be so huge? And the reason is the magnetic field has to be uniform. These are called Helmholtz coils. They have to be extremely uniform. But we can use computers to compensate for a weak, irregular magnetic field. In Germany, two physicists invented the world's smallest MRI machine, fully operational and it's the size of a briefcase. Scientific American interviewed these German physicists and they said, how small can you make an MRI machine? And the answer is this big. You will have in your cell phone more computer power than a modern university hospital today. And you will have it very soon 
the power of an MRI scan inside your cell phone according to the laws of physics. And what will we do with this information? We will scan your DNA. Today it costs $1,000 to have every single gene in your body listed. This is an owner's manual for your body. Your laptop, your PC, they all have an owner's manual. Everything you have has an owner's manual except for one thing. You. You have no owner's manual. You will have that owner's manual. And what will we do with it? We will grow organs of the body as they wear out. This is an ear. It's made out of plastic. It's biodegradable. You take cells from your own ear, stick it inside, they proliferate, forming a perfect ear, then the plastic dissolves. This is bone on the left. We can now create almost limited quanti unlimited quantities of bone. This is cartilage on the right. Ears, noses on the right. And this is the first bladder. An entire bladder grown from your own cells. We can grow heart valves, blood vessels, bone, skin, cartilage, noses, ears with today's technology. And in five years' time, we hope to grow the first liver. So in the States, I always say, for you alcoholics in the audience, take heart. We will grow new livers of the body. So as I tell my American audiences, drink up. And even the brain, we're now beginning to crudely image the brain as it thinks. This is the brain on the left as it tells the truth, not much happens. But when you tell a lie, your brain lights up <laughs> like a Christmas tree when you tell a lie. Because you have to know the truth, you have to create the lie, and you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the previous lies you've been telling all these years. That's a lot of brain power. And we can now hook up at Brown University a stroke victim who is paralyzed. We put a chip right here, right here at the sensory motor cortex, stick it to a computer, and this person who is paralyzed can now play video games, surf the web, write email, answer email, do crossword puzzles, and he is paralyzed. And here's my colleague, Stephen Hawking. He can only blink. That's all he can do. So a scientist hooked up a single channel EEG sensor on his right frame of his glasses. Look at his glasses. There's a single channel EEG sensor, picks up brain waves, and allows him to communicate with the outside world. And then, of course, the aging process is the big one. Is it possible that we can stop the aging process? Well, at the present time, probably not. But in the future, there's a definite possibility because we now know what aging is. We didn't even know what aging was a few decades ago. Aging is, in one word, error. Information error. The buildup of error. The accumulated errors in our genes, in cellular debris, all that error makes cells work slower. They get sluggish. That's why skin cells start to sag. That's why muscle loses tone. That's why bone becomes brittle, because air buildup. But we can now replace, we can now accentuate air correction mechanism. The body has its own air correction mechanism. For example, I didn't know this till I interviewed quite a few biologists. Did you know that some animals never die? They simply age forever. I didn't know that. The animals which don't age are alligators, crocodiles, some sea turtles, and the female flounder. They never get old. They just get bigger, but they never age. Now, you, say, you might say to yourself, ha, that's not true. I mean, everybody knows that alligators, look at the internet, they live to be 70. But you see, that's when the zookeeper died. No one has ever seen an alligator age. They simply get bigger. Now, in the forest, the swamp, they do die. 
uh, disease, predators, accidents, starvation. Yeah, they die. But in the zoos, they don't die. And take a look at our chimpanzee, our closest evolutionary neighbor. We are 98.5% equivalent to a chimpanzee, but we live twice as long. And we are smarter than a chimpanzee, but only a handful of genes separate us. Now, before I give the microphone to Ray, let me just make one last parting comment. When I was a child growing up, I had a childhood hero, and that was Albert Einstein. And my favorite Einstein story is this. When Einstein was an old man, he was tired of giving the same talk over and over again. So one day his chauffeur came up to him and he said, Professor, I'm really a part-time actor. I've heard your speech so many times, I've memorized it. So why don't we switch places? I will put on a mustache and a wig. I will be the great Einstein and you can take a rest and be my chauffeur. Well, Einstein loved the joke, so they switched places. And this went along famously until one day, a mathematician in the back asked a very difficult question. And Einstein thought, oh, the game is up. But then the chauffeur said, that question is so elementary that even my chauffeur here can answer it for you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Great audience. Thank you.